is proud to welcome Tim Greiner, Managing Director for uh, Pure Strategies today as our speaker. I would like to take a few minutes just to make sure everyone can hear me okay. I'll use the chat box as well. By now you should be hearing audio. You should also see Tim's presentation, his first slide on your screen. It's called Greening Stonyfield Farm, and it has the date in his name. If you're having any trouble at all, either hearing me clearly or seeing that presentation slide, please feel free to either use the questions box and go to webinar or use the chat window. During this presentation, I will actually be answering any kind of technical problems or fixing technical problems in the background. So you can always use the questions box or the chat window um, to ask questions or get some help if you have any kind of trouble with audio or visuals during the presentation. I'd like to go ahead and get started. I don't see any questions. That's great. That means everyone can hear and see us, or at least they, uh, they don't know yet that they have a problem. Hopefully folks are, are hearing and seeing us just fine. We would like to go ahead and get started. Like I said, we're very, very happy to have Tim with us today. Tim is a 1992 Switzer Fellow. The Robert and Patricia Switzer Foundation supports environmental leadership by um, uh, providing graduate students with grants, graduate students who are doing important environmental work with grants, and then help, continues to help support them throughout their career with network opportunities, um, communications training, and additional grant opportunities. Uh, Tim is, is one of our very successful grantees in the world of business, and so it's really a pleasure to have him. We've already sponsored a number of webinars this year dealing with environmental issues, climate change, adaptation, uh, conservation, and other topics. But this is actually our first webinar that we're sponsoring in the world of business, finance, and sustainability planning for companies and corporations. So without further ado, let me go ahead and jump into a couple of web keeping, housekeeping, uh, webinar housekeeping details. And then we'll give Tim the floor so that he can have the bulk of our time today together for his presentation. So. So during this webinar, as I mentioned before, I will actually be helping in the background with any questions that you may have of a technical nature, um, helping you troubleshoot your connection to us. But also, I will actually, during, present, during Tim's presentation, I will actually be helping to uh, pass your questions along to Tim. So you'll have multiple opportunities to ask questions today. During the presentation itself, please always feel free to use either the questions box or the chat window to pose a question to us. Uh, I'll be passing those along to Tim uh, when he asks for questions. And then, of course, at the very end of the presentation, you'll have ample opportunity to ask uh, Tim questions directly, either using the chat and question window or using your telephone or headset, however you logged in to listen to our webinar today. Um, at that point, you'll be able to use the raise hand button. I will remind you of that uh, when, when that time comes. During the presentation itself, we hope that you will go ahead and use the chat window or the questions box. Again, we already have our first question uh, asking if the presentation slides will be available afterwards. Yes, they will be. You'll be receiving an email about an hour after the presentation ends, giving you the link where you can view this webinar again. You can pass that link along to colleagues and friends, and the slides will also be there. Um, you'll receive the link in about an hour. The slides and video themselves probably won't be up until about uh, this same time tomorrow. It will take us about 24 hours to turn around uh, all of the material. So thank you very much for that question, Jen. Jen, if you wouldn't mind going ahead and advancing the slides to uh, to that webinar housekeeping slide, uh, that would be that would be great. And I'll go over the, the last couple of details for those of you who are just arriving. Um, the all of your microphones are muted for now. You see that's point number two, but you will definitely have a chance to ask questions at the end of the webinar using your telephone or headset. And as I mentioned before, I will be monitoring questions during the webinar. So please do feel free to pass content or technical questions along to me during that time. All right, with no further ado, let me go ahead and turn the floor over to Tim. Uh, Tim, please feel free to introduce yourself, add some more details, ones that I forgot or that you feel are important that folks know about you as you go through your presentation today. And thank you for being with us. OK, great. Thanks, Lauren. And thanks to the uh, Switzer Foundation for uh, putting together the webinar and giving me a chance to uh, talk about greening Stonyfield Farm. Um, so I'm a, as Lauren mentioned, I'm a 1992 Switzer Fellow. And Switzer was uh, very helpful in providing uh, funding for some of the research I did in graduate school, looking at the intersection of business and the environment, and particularly around uh, chemicals and toxic chemicals and products and in manufacturing. 
Um, so my position is I'm the managing director of Pure Strategies, and I thought I'd, I have a couple of slides on Pure Strategies and who we are, and then I'll dive into uh, our presentation about Stonyfield Farm. Uh, Pure Strategies is a consulting company that's been around about 16 years, and we help companies accelerate their sustainability journey through a variety of different um, services that we provide, including corporate strategy, looking at clean and lean production, helping companies align their supply chains with their own sustainability goals, looking at safer chemicals and sustainable materials, product design. We conduct life cycle analyses, and um, we also uh, write sustainability or CSR reports for some of our clients. And um, most of our business is focused in the consumer product space, although we work with companies that don't make consumer products um, that are in the B2B area. And some of these uh, logos you may recognize, others you may not. Um, but these are companies anywhere ranging from um, 20 million in sales up to some very large companies, uh, well over several billion dollars in sales that uh, we help with. And they, all these companies tend to be in various places of their sustainability journey. But today is about Stonyfield Farm. Uh, so most of us, or most of you, I hope, know who Stonyfield is. They're the uh, the organic category leader. They're the third largest yogurt company in the U.S. They sell not only yogurt, but also organic milk, various kinds of drinks, uh, and ice cream. Uh, Stonyfield was founded, um, well, I'll go, I guess we're going to step back a minute. Let's go back to 2001. Stonyfield today, large company, Actually, Danone today owns 85% of Stonyfield. That's Danon, but uh, if you're in France, it's Danone. And um, they purchased uh, uh, an equity stake in Stonyfield, I think it was back in something like 2006, um, and today own 85% of the company. And one of the things Stonyfield Farm has been able to do within Danone is to take organic that Stonyfield really made um, possible from a business standpoint, getting organic products to consumers, and now they're helping Danone do that internationally in a bunch of markets where there is no or was no organic yogurt and organic milk products, uh, markets like Brazil and some markets in Europe. But let's go back to 2001. Um, 2001, that was the time when uh, Janet Jackson was a popular musician. Um, the Lord of the Rings came out. And uh, maybe a little more dubious, uh, Microsoft released Windows XP. Um, and Apple Computer re uh, released the first iPod 10 years ago, or more than that, 11 years ago. And what was happening at Stonyfield Farm? Well, they were still a young company. Although they had been around for quite a few years, they, by, by 2001, they weren't much over $50 million in sales. They were a natural yogurt company, 30% organic. They had no, um, no recombinant bovine growth hormones in their milk at all or any, any of their products. They're based in Londonderry, New Hampshire. And um, at that time, they were the number five yogurt manufacturer in the US. They had about 150 employees. And the VP of Natural Resources, Nancy Hirschberg, she's pictured here. Um, she's a very dynamic woman. and have been with the company quite a long time. She's the sister of the founder, Gary Hirschberg, who probably many of you have known or seen speak. And uh, Nancy's job uh, at that time was VP of Natural Resources. And Nancy, um, for years, as the company was growing, was very small, kind of held the responsibility of sustainability at Stonyfield Farm. And that was everything from packaging to what happened in the plant to working with uh, the nascent organic industry, developing feed, finding farmers, finding access to organic milk, in addition, organic sugar, organic um, strawberries and other ingredients, uh, working with family farmers to help them through that process. So 10 years ago, this was still a very niche business. Um, and the whole area of like a, a green business was also very niche. Sustainability was um, the confines of companies like uh, Ben and Jerry's and Seventh Generation, Stonyfield Farm, and was not very prevalent among the large 
uh, businesses that we see today. So Nancy had an issue was she was realizing that she kept on pushing all these initiatives, but um, she had a problem. And the problem was how could she get other people in the company to make it their responsibility to do sustainability. Now at that time in 2001, half the middle managers in the company had been there less than two years. And in fact, many of those middle managers have come, had come from conventional um, industries. So they had run maybe manufacturing operations at a conventional dairy plant, or had worked in marketing at a conventional company. They hadn't come out of the natural foods movement. Um, so, and I think what Stonyfield was about drew them there, obviously, but they hadn't grown up with the company uh, in any real significant way. So there was still some education to do around what sustainability was and what it meant for Stonyfield Farm. And at the same time, um, there wasn't the larger culture of sustainability that we see today. At that time, again, it was very niche. So Nancy was looking for um, a, a framework or a program, a way to talk about sustainability inside the company. And at that time, there was even a very popular, sustainability itself wasn't a very popular term. So she began looking for a framework, a way to think about sustainability, and then a way to measure it within the company. And the measurement system had to build off of the indicators or the framework itself. So um, I met with Nancy at this time, and I was, uh, um, had finished uh, grad school a few years before that, and uh, she and I were talking and we decided to work on this project together. And the first thing we decided is that we needed some kind of framework. And in our meetings, we came up with four different possible ones. One was called the natural step. Another was a framework developed by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. A third one was to build the framework around the so-called three-legged stool. So that's the idea of uh, so social issues, environmental issues, and economic issues. And then the fourth idea was to build the framework around the Stonyfield mission. So um, I want you to take a sec and just think about which of those four do you think makes most sense for building a sustainability program around? I mean, would it be something like the natural step, which has a terrific set of principles, World Business Council for Sustainable, sustainable Development, which is really focused on business sustainability, the three-legged stool, or the Stonyfield Farm mission? And uh, and I'll get to my answer. So just think about that for a minute and what some of the trade-offs might have been. Well, as, as we thought about it, the leading candidates were the top three. But, you know, it didn't make sense in the end because one of the things that Nancy and I determined was that we really needed to create a mission around the company that, that was understandable to the company. It couldn't be some exogenous system. It had to be something that was internal in the company. And we went back and we pulled out Gary Hirschberg's original mission statement, which he literally scrawled on the back of a napkin when he founded the company back in 78 and he went to investors and asked for money. And we unearthed that and we started looking at it and we were saying, could this be the basis for creating a program around sustainability at the company? So. We wanted to do a few things. We wanted to think about mission performance and use this as a means of, on an ongoing basis to track performance in the company. We wanted to use to identify opportunities and to also implement projects that really related to the mission. So as we, as we looked at that mission, we found out, hey, there are five, five points to Gary's napkin. There was, number one, a point around responsible business that uh, that they can that Stonyfield would serve as a model that an environmentally and socially responsible business can be profitable. So out of that, we said, okay, well, we have a mission around being a model and being profitable. We have a point there. The second was to educate consumers and producers about the value of protecting the environment and of supporting family farmers and sustainable farming methods. So the second mission point became. A, uh, a focus on family farms and sustainable agriculture and educating consumers and producers. The third part of the mission talks about employees and employee welfare, and that became the third 
pillar to the program. The fourth one was about a return on investment. And so like the first one, it related to profit. And we said this has to be a key pillar of our initiative. And the fifth part of the mission talked about quality. And that became the final pillar that, under, that would be the construct for us forming the sustainability program at Stonyfield Farm. So with, with these, these areas, we set off to do a couple of things. We work with a team of 12 middle managers over a three-month period to come up with performance metrics around the mission. We also found out, we went around and we talked to middle managers, we talked to people on the floor. Almost nobody in the company could recite the mission or tell us what the mission was. It wasn't that they didn't have some sense of the mission. It was specifically the mission itself. The company had never, as it grew, um, really trained folks on the mission. So we did mission training for employees. We brought in outside speakers. We brought in a farmer to talk about sustainable agriculture. We brought in external stakeholders to talk about um, uh, about things like pesticides and herbicides on farms, talk about efficient manufacturing, talk about global issues and global sustainability. And we, so we built an a education program around the idea of introducing the mission into the company. And we also built mission education into the formal um, HR process so when a new employee came on board, they learned about the company's mission. One of the next things we did then was to sit down with this middle management team and try to come up with a bunch of indicators that would measure sustainability. So they were very ambitious about the indicators that they wanted to see. And they started with we started sitting down and saying, well, how could we develop some kind of mission report, something that we could produce quarterly that could measure Stonyfield Farms' performance against its um, mission, and um, that it could identify gaps in mission performance, and that then these middle managers, the folks who are in charge of manufacturing or marketing or sourcing or um, packaging or transportation, could then identify the key things that they should work on to improve performance. And then we would put this in the form of a dashboard. So this was a very exciting time. And we encouraged folks to think really broadly about how we could do this. But then, uh, so then we started producing the metrics. And the team produced a lot of metrics. So here we have metrics on employee well-being. We had 15 metrics on employee well-being. Quite a few, really. Some the company was already tracking and others we had to introduce. So obviously the company was tracking a lot of the enjoyable workplace indicators. But what about some of those opportunities to gain new skills and advanced personal career goals? Some of those weren't formally tracked. So anyway, we set up a system to track them, put them on the dashboard. Then we looked at family farms. We came up with five family farm indicators. Um, and these. Some of these had been tracked, but several hadn't been. We figured out, OK, well, how many organic acres is the company supporting through its purchase of um, organic milk? How many small family dairy farms is the company supporting? What percentage of milk comes from small farms? And I think our definition for a small farm was uh, less than 100 cows, which is a small farm. Then we came up with um, measures for the environment. Uh, so we had eight measures on the environment, resource, and then we group them into these subcategories, resource use, pesticides and toxics, and energy use. We still weren't done. We had metrics on profitability, five different metrics on profitability, and these were tracked by the company already, and then three on quality. So when we were done with our team, we had 36 metrics, and I was worried. I told and I think Nancy was worried. But Nancy wanted it to be comprehensive and this dashboard to be updated and kept and reported on quarterly and be actionable by people in the company. And can you guess what happened? We had complete system failure. It just turns out that 36 metrics is way too many, too many things to keep track of, too much for a dashboard and too much for a company that previously didn't have any systems to focus on. 
So we produced this sustainability dashboard for, well, I think it went on for about a year and a quarter before it just fell under its own weight. And then we rationalized the number of indicators from 36 down to 7. And that was better, those seven indicators. But still, when Nancy looked at what was happening in the company, it was the same old thing. It was Nancy and her staff trying to push folks in the company to do sustainability work. And they wanted to do it. But ultimately, the metrics weren't really what mattered. Because we couldn't get the responsibility and the accountability was not really part of the part of each of these department heads and each of the departments. It wasn't where it needed to be. Responsibility for sustainability performance was with the sustainability department. So we decided we needed to pivot and try something different. So in, in 2006, we launched a, a different kind of program. And what we did was to go off-site and invite um, all the managers of all the basic functional departments in the company and their key staff members and asked and, and put them into teams. We formed in total uh, nine teams, and I'll get to the teams in a minute. But they were the teams around, for example, energy use and greenhouse gas emissions, transportation, packaging, supply chain, zero waste, green chemistry. And each of these teams um, at this meeting was asked to sit down and develop near-term goals and long-term stretch goals. And they were given 30 days after they develop, uh, 30 days after this meeting to develop an action plan for the first year of the program. And they needed to articulate what they were going to do to achieve these goals and what resources or help they might need from Nancy and her team and what they might need from outside resources. Now, if you look at the sustainable packaging goals at the bottom, that's a pretty good example. So remember, this is back in... I guess it's 2006, so one of the goals, the sustainable packaging goal team came up with was achieve 100% sustainable packaging by 2015 and to make a 10% annual improvement in sustainable packaging between 2007 and 2015. Now, nobody knew what sustainable packaging was at the time. And this was a very uncomfortable pr practice for folks who usually, when they set goals, they know exactly how they're going to achieve them. We're going to reduce our uh, raw material costs. We're going to reduce our waste generation. We're going to um, improve yield on a line. Um, typically, when uh, a manager commits him or herself or their department to a goal like that, they have a pretty good idea how they're going to do this. In this case, we were asking them to set stretch goals, which they had no idea how they might achieve and also one-year goals. So these action plans were due 30 days after the meeting. And uh, they had to be approved by Gary Hirschberg, the CEO of the company. So it gave um, the teams time to go back and sit with their, um, the folks in their department or that would contribute to the team and figure out what, what made most sense for the goal and what kind of resources they might need and what a one-year action plan might look like. We then built these goals into the job descriptions, the performance review, and the bonus structure of the company. And I think this was a critical shift in the way that Stonyfield and Nancy went about thinking about sustainability, building it, and we, we, building it into the very fabric of those who were really responsible for um, all these key decisions. What do we source? Where do we source it? What do we make? How do we make it? What do we package it in? How do we move that product? These are the nine teams um, that I mentioned earlier. And maybe I'd like to give a little more detail to uh, how we really made this process work. And I think it's, it's scalable to uh, any company that's really thinking about how to integrate sustainability um, in, the, in a similar way that uh, Stonyfield did. So what we ended up doing was linking 
it through their normal strategic planning and budgeting process. We wanted sustainability to be part of that just the same way that you think about um, adding production capacity and planning for that, or the way you would think about um, addressing a manufacturing issue or improving throughput for the line that might be a manufacturing goal. So um, this program called MAP, we, what we introduced was in June and August, developing the strategy for MAP and seeking executive support. So before that big MAP meeting, we sat down, we said, this is what we want to do. Here's the big plan. That was the strategy. The executive support was going to Gary Hirschberg and the senior VPs in the company and getting their support for this MAP program. Then in September, December, that's when we had the, the big offsite meeting where the MAP teams were formed. They set their targets. They set their plans. They developed budgets. They basically drafted how these performance targets would be in their own personal performance evaluations. And it was critical to do it this time, at this time of year because Stonyfield farms on a calendar year planning basis. So the same time that the company was budgeting for everything else, they were budgeting for sustainability. So that meant if an energy efficiency goal was to get, get a 10% improvement in a energy use per uh, yogurt production, then at this time they could budget as part of the whether the it was the capital budgeting process or the regular expense process or the human resource budget, the resources they would need to do that. Did they need to buy equipment? Did the engineering group need to do special studies? Um, what is what was it they needed to do to achieve their goals? And then in January through May, that was all about execution, the first six months. And Nancy's team supported the efforts of um, all these nine teams as they, as they did their work. And then after the first six months, we had our first mid-year summit. And this was a very interesting meeting because um, one of the things if you work in, in, uh, in the corporate world, you know is that uh, management's always introducing new initiatives. And you never quite know if the initiative is going to stick around or not. Um, and because there's lots of demands on any manager, so at any given time they might have too much to do and they figure out what do I have to do and what can I kind of get rid of. Well, one of the things we did with MAP was after six months we held another offsite meeting and we had each of the teams present their results. And it was fascinating because there were a couple of teams that knocked it out of the park. And there were a couple of other teams that quite frankly didn't. And you could sense that those middle managers and those project team leads wanted to be successful, that they didn't want to get up there in front of their peers and report um, that they hadn't progressed very far in their project plans and goals. And we continued this, this um, process of doing semi-annual updates on the MAP program for about three or four years. So that meant twice a year, once every summer, mid-year, and then once every late fall during the planning process, we would have the teams present their, their overall program and the results they were achieving. And what we, by doing this, um, we were really building this, this sustainability into the formal planning process of the company and into the culture of the organization in a way that it hadn't previously been done. It was no longer the natural resources job to achieve sustainability. It was spread throughout the company. So what were the results? Well, if you look back over the last few years, the company's done phenomenal things. Not only has it grown, um, sales have continued to grow and grow, um, but they've achieved some phenomenal reductions. So here's just an example of a few, but the company achieved a 46% absolute reduction in the transportation of its products to its customers over a four-year period. That saved them $7.6 million. But moreover, excuse me, during that time period, they probably grew, I don't know the exact number, but I would say sales grew 20 to 30% during that time period. So to achieve that level of reduction despite some significant growth is amazing. 
And they did that through a variety of means, completely overhauling their transportation infrastructure, the way they moved product from their factory in New Hampshire to all their customers via, via on the West Coast or Chicago or down in Atlanta or here locally in New England where uh, I'm based and where the company's based. And they, they shifted from um, to more of a hub and spoke system and there's more detail on their website you can learn about their transportation improvements. They're quite spectacular. The company also did some phenomenal uh, plastics reduction. So one of the things they did was to re-engineer their plastic cups and reduce the need for plastic. So that's why today when you buy some of the um, products in the store, there's just a foil seal on the top of the cup. Uh, there always used to be a plastic um, lid on the cup. And uh, they were an innovator in this way in terms of saying, why do we need that? Can we package the cup and deliver it to market, ensure product quality, um, and ensure that we won't have spills and leaks and breaks of some kind and reduce the packaging that's required. They were able to thin wall the cup and work with their plastics manufacturer. And that achieved some real savings for them. And more recently, they were the uh, first company to bring to market a cup based upon on um, PLA plastic, which is uh, corn-derived polymer. Uh, and so they have a cup now that's not, no longer petroleum-based. Gary's goal is to have a plastic cup that one day might be edible. He would like a zero-waste cup. Um, they're not there yet, um, and PLA is by no means perfect as a polymer, but um, it's a movement away from fossil fuel-based plastics you know, um, to package their products. They reduced their facility energy and greenhouse gas emissions by 11%, again, despite the growth and did this through a variety of things you might imagine what they might be, but not, it's not only lighting, heating, cooling, motors, getting a system in to efficiently run that plant, but also, um, you know, if you, if you build a greenfield site, you have the opportunity to, com to completely integrate all the heating and cooling that's required in yogurt, but if you have an existing facility that's been built one piece at a time starting back in the 90s, you don't have that luxury. And they did a lot of very careful engineering studies to figure out every time they modified the plant how they could best do that in a means of also reducing the energy load of the plant. And lastly, solid waste reduction. They've reduced it by 39%. Um, and if you walk throughout that plant, it's phenomenal what they've done to eliminate and avoid waste and, and then recycle what they can't uh, eliminate and avoid. So, oh, here's another summary of those achievements. Okay, so I guess I'm I'm wrapping up here. I just want to talk about um, kind of what's the what's the utter truth. I needed a cow pun, and this was the best I could do. Um, that's the moose, as they say at Stonyfield. But seriously, um, if you're interested in working in business sustainability. Um, integrating sustainability into the business is much more than having metrics. It's much more than having a sustainability officer. And it's much more than a bunch of good ideas. It's really about building it into the fabric of the business and understanding how do I make the business case. At Stonyfield Farm, making the business case wasn't, wasn't that hard. The founder based the company's mission in part on sustainability. But in today's marketplace, Large retailers are asking for sustainability, right? Consumers are expecting it, and businesses need to understand how can we make the case internally. And then if we can make that case, because either it's a competitive advantage, we can save money, we can increase uh, consumer or customer loyalty, then how do we operationalize that? How do we bring that into the business in a way that gets folks in manufacturing that all they really care about might be did we get enough product out the door by the end of the month, by the end of the quarter? Um, how do we get them to care about reducing waste, reducing energy use, and improving the sustainability performance? So um, I guess at this point, um, I'll turn it back to Lauren, who's going to uh, manage any questions we might have.
Thank you, Kim. Thank you very much. Um, we do actually already have two questions. One is from, and I, I apologize if I mispronounce your name, Eliav Batan um, is asking, and, and this is actually from earlier in the presentation, um, before you had the MAPS process, when you um, first started working with them in 2001, this is what the question relates to. The question is, can you explain the reason for working with middle managers versus other employee groups? How did you determine how would, who would be in your team? Oh, that's a great question. At the time, um, Nancy was seeking to work with those middle managers. It was really Nancy's call. So, um, and her her desire then was to take this new group of middle managers that were really starting to run the operations and run marketing and run supply chain and work with them to integrate sustainability in their job functions. So. Well, it's useful to train workers on the line or folks who work in accounting or marketing on sustainability, the kind of the line workers. Um, we knew that we needed to reach up for higher in the organization and get the buy-in of these middle managers. And um, so that's the reason we chose that level. We already had the support of Gary and the people who reported to Gary. It was the middle management group. And if you look at many companies, Sustainability is often can be blessed by the CEO, encouraged by the board, and embraced by the people out on the floor, but it's middle management where the rubber hits the road. Great. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I had my, my microphone muted. Um, so uh, I also just want to remind everyone, we've got a nice number of questions coming in on the questions panel. You are also welcome to use uh, your microphone or your telephone, whichever you've signed in with today. All you need to do is use the raise hand button, and I will be able to call on you in order of your questions. But in the meantime, while you're thinking about those questions, we have a few more. Here's one from Mark Switzer, who's here on the board of the uh, Switzer Foundation. And his question is, how much of a model um, has the MAP process proved to be in the industry? Well, Gary talks about it at his many of the uh, public speaking um, public speaking um, things that he does around the country and internationally, um, and we've used it with a bunch of other clients as well. So we've uh, we recently started working with Radio Flyer, the Red Wagon company. We use a similar process. We use the same process with um, Rockline Incorporated. They're a supplier of wipes to Walmart. Um, and the process, I mean, my, my experience is um, it works really, really well. Um, and that's a great question, though. I mean, I think how do we get this model out so other companies can take advantage of it? And so this webinar is a chance for us to do that. Gary's talking is a way to do that. And if you go to the Stonyfield site, they explicitly talk about the MAP process and how this was instrumental in um, where they organize sustainability within the company. Great. Here's a question from Linda. She says, I like the idea of having the teams come up with goals rather than the sustainability staff. How did you consider what the consumers, customers, and NGOs value or want in sustainability? Oh, that's a great question. So the part of that offsite meeting um, was some pre-work that we did for all the participants. So one of the things we knew we wanted to do for those teams was to ground them in what are consumers asking for, what are our customers asking for, what are our NGO stakeholders seeking, so that we have a clear sense of what, what do the external stakeholders care about with it when it comes to sustainability. And a lot of that wasn't very well articulated in 2001 in the way it is today, right? Stonyfield didn't have really many competitors in the natural yogurt space, right? Um, Whole Foods was the primary customer at that time that was really pushing sustainability and cared. And, and as Whole Foods grew, so did Stonyfield Farm. The NGOs at the time, they were pretty clear about some of the issues, whether it was climate change or pesticides and herbicides, organic agriculture, or access to um, wholesome food. So but that's critically important. Um, for any company embarking on a sustainability planning process like that is that the people in the room um, come into this grounded in exactly those issues. 
Okay, the next question uh, is from Jen. It's a, it's a written question I'll read out, and then we'll actually have an audio question from Caden. So um, Jen writes in, who in the organization is responsible, or in your opinion should be responsible, for evaluating whether sustainability goals are realistic? Zero waste sounds great, but in many companies this would take many years. There's not going to be a quick, warm, fuzzy result to report back. Uh, that's a good question. So um, <clears throat> the way I've done this with uh, oops. the way that we've done that, uh, uh, broached that issue in the planning process is as follows. Um, typically, for the first time a company does a sustainability, goes through a process like this and sets sustainability goals. Um, we ask the CEO to stand up in the room at the meeting and say, we're not leaving here without you setting goals today. And uh, because most of the managers who oversee the functions that I talked about, they don't want to set goals that they don't know that they can meet. And they also want to, for good reason, right? I mean, especially if you're going to be bonused and measured on uh, your, the goals you set, then you want to know you can meet them, or you want to know you got a good chance at least. So typically what we'll do in that meeting is we'll require the, these managers to set one-year goals, and they're typically going to set them around like 2 or 3% adjusted for production in the first year. Um, and we give them 30 days. We call it a sobering up period after the meeting. You can come back to us and change those goals if you think that they're not good enough or that if you think that you can either improve them and make them stronger, or if you, for some reason you can justify um, backing off from them. Once the business has experience understanding uh, what it's going to cost to achieve a goal and how they might go about doing it, then um, we can ask them to make something like a five-year goal or even to talk about what are our long-term aspirations? You know, um, if you think about it, like a company like Walmart has a long-term aspiration of being powered by 100% renewable energy, right? Um, well, what does that mean year one? What does that mean year five? What does that mean year ten? We need a the company needs a little bit of experience in building capacity to be able to answer that question. So I don't think about um, I think about the goal-setting process as something that. Um, in, the, in a more mature company, a company that has a more mature sustainability program, that goal setting process is done knowledgeable of the outside environment, stakeholder needs, the competitors, and the customers. And then it's a negotiation because goals come with often money involved. Um, and figuring out what are the human resource and capital needs to achieve those goals. So I don't know if that, um, that's not a, um, I, that's somewhat of an indirect answer to that question, but I think um, it's a learning process and a comfort process. We had one client, they could not get their head around setting an aspirational goal. So their goal ended up being zero fossil fuels, um, th th that their operations would be powered by zero fossil fuels in the future. That's their aspirational goal. That took two meetings. It was a substantial part of the conversation, that type of goal, because they were like, we don't understand how we'll ever get to zero fossil fuels. We just don't really see how it will happen. Therefore, even from an aspirational standpoint, why would we set that? They're a bunch of engineers. They, they want to know how they're going to do it. And we had to convince them that, hey, technology will change. Um, who is to say what the future of the uh, way we'll produce electricity and power, and power will be like? Um, so you're not putting a date on it you can set an aspirational goal. Great. Our next question is from Caden. Caden, I've got your mic unmuted, so you can ask your question. Great. Thanks. Um, I actually have uh, two questions, but one of them is off topic, and one of them is both selfish and off topic. Um, so you can decline to comment um, if, if that's the right thing to do. The, the first question is whether you would be willing to speak at all about what's happening at Walmart. Um, and the second question, is what could somebody like me do to get the experience needed to be hireable by your company or a company like it? So, I, uh, um, could you tell me what more about what? What do you mean by what's happening at Walmart? 
Well, I just saw that Walmart was one of the companies that that you're working with. Um, I had, and I've just heard various things over the years about what Walmart is doing to try to, you know, decrease um, trucking or change packaging or, you know, make more sustainable products available. And I just was hoping to get someone's take on it that is knowledgeable instead of just mm -hmm. the random tidbits that I've accumulated. <laughs> right. Well, uh, we are working with Walmart on um, some of the some of their initiatives around product sustainability and improving, for the lack of a better term, the sustainability ness of products. And I can tell you, they're working very closely with the sustainability consortium. And um, in my view, um, the or a leading, the or among the leaders in the retail world, in in really understanding the science around sustainability of products, and then encouraging suppliers to provide more sustainable products. So they're quite serious. They have pretty pretty big investments there. And um, and then the stuff they've done on the operations side, we, we haven't worked on that. But uh, what from what I've read, there's been some real accomplishments. Um, so there's, there's also lots of uh, people have a lot of different feelings about Walmart. Um, but I can tell you to answer your question about what they're doing on products, at least they're quite a bit of activity there. And Caden, on the second one, um, so I, I think that um, getting some concrete experience in business is very, very helpful. Um, understanding how businesses develop products, launch products, um, how they uh, source materials, um, how they market them, you're really in any of those areas, that's really helpful fodder and background. Um, but there's so many different roles one could play right in the sustainability space, whether as an NGO advocate and working with companies to either, because a lot of companies, they need help. Their sustainability staffs are not um, you know, as well resourced as we would like. So uh, there's plenty of opportunity from the NGO community to partner with companies, and we see it all the time today. I mean, it was a rarity 10 years ago that NGOs were working very closely with business, and today we see much more of it. Um, so I don't know if there's any one path. There's multiple paths, but certainly getting experience with business and industry um, is one that I'd recommend if uh, you wanted to do the type of work that, um, that I'm talking about today. And I should add that Caden is actually one of our Switzer Fellows um, who's on the call today. We have about an even mix of Switzer Fellows and folks from outside the foundation. Um, and Caden, just to, to add our two cents, you know, Lisa is always open to having conversations with fellows about your career and about where things are going. And it's one of the benefits of being part of the Switzer network as a fellow is that we do have access then to fellows like Tim or others who are in the business community who can, they can add their two cents to what Lisa has to say about about how you can sort of be strategic about where you get additional education or where you uh, take your next step career-wise. So I just wanted to put that plug in for Carlos's for mentoring, uh, mentoring facility. Um, we have a follow-up question here from Linda, and it's actually right on topic with what you were speaking about just now with Walmart, but this, of course, addresses Stonyfield Farm. She says, since the company relies on co-packers and farmers for its products and its production, how did you assure that their operations we're part of the program, or aren't they? Good question. So um, back in 2001 and 2006, co-packers played a fairly minor role in, overall in Stonyfield production. Um, so just so, certain SKUs are made by co-packers. Um, this issue is actually small for Stonyfield, but much bigger for a lot of brands. There are tons of brands out there that don't make the products at all, right? They rely on contract manufacturers to make um, all of the components and parts or even the products themselves, right? And um, and the challenge is often that, um, for example, for Stonyfield Farm, so some of their co-packers, Stonyfield Farm, might be 10 to 15 percent of their business. So when you represent 5, 10, 15 percent of somebody's business, your ability to sway and change them is far less than, let's say, you represent 50 or 60 percent of their business. So, um, but that still doesn't mean that you know that's an excuse. It just that's the reality. 
the best way to do it is right at the onset of the relationship, that that's a requirement for doing business with Stonyfield Farm or if you're talking seventh generation or radio flyer, that, that the, um, the, the people in the company that go out and find those business partnerships and those co-packers or those tier one suppliers build that in into the qualification just in the same way that you want quality, you want delivery, you want innovation, you also need sustainability to be part of that conversation. It's much harder to go back and retrofit an old relationship. Um, so uh, in the case of Stonyfield Farm, um, initially uh, the whole MAP program was really, really focused on, because, because the co-packers made up such a small component, um, was really focused on their own operations. Today it's extended to the co-packers. So the co-packers have sustainability metrics. There's an engagement program. They're, it's part of their evaluation. Um, if I look at uh, seventh generation, same thing. It's part of the way they bring new suppliers in. It's the way that they're dealing with existing suppliers. Great. We have a couple of questions here from Stephanie. Um, the first one is she's asking if you could just talk a bit more about the timing for the phases of implementation of the MAP process from gathering the input to delivering results. OK. So um, so I did the little, the, the, the metrics thing was like, that was the failure, right? We, we try to just put a bunch of metrics out there and measure sustainability and think that that was going to work. And it didn't work. And then the MAP project came along. And um, so we literally, we spent the summer planning. We waited till late summer to sit down with, um, with Gary and his senior team to say, here's what we want to do. We then had the initial MAP meeting. We had the, we, we started doing mission education around what's the mission. Um, we, we did some of the, um, also background training on, um, you know, having like a brown bag type things or guest speakers in, um, talking about customer, consumer needs around sustainability. And then we had the offsite meeting um, in the fall, to, just, to, just as the budgeting process was getting going, where we gave at that meeting the, uh, the teams established their ambitious 10-year goal, right, the long-term goal, and then their one-year work plan, their one-year goal. Um, and at, during that day, at the end of the day, they gave us their, their notes, but then we said, okay, you have a month to finalize your plan. So within 30 days after the meeting, we had a finalized plan that had their resources, their goals, and their, their kind of one-year action plan. And we reviewed them with Gary. He signed off on them. And that was all completed by before the budgeting process was complete. So that was done by November. So then we had a, a meeting in the summer where folks from the company presented their results. Um, the different teams presented their results. We had another meeting um, late in the fall, right around the planning process. We did it the following summer. We did it the following fall. Then we went to once a year um, on these uh, MAP meetings so folks could talk about the uh, performance against their targets. So that's kind of the general timeline. Hopefully that was helpful. So we still have a couple more minutes, but we have a, a series of questions here. So I'm just going to run through them uh, and let you answer which ones you think uh, you can cover in a few minutes, Kim. Okay. Stephanie had a follow-up where she was asking about um, your thoughts about most widely accepted reporting protocols. That you, so that you can compare apples to apples when you're benchmarking against industry sectors. So maybe mm -hmm. you could address that, and then I'll organize these last two questions offline. I suppose today GRI is the best. So there's a GRI standard. Um, but it's really a reporting standard. It's not a performance standard. And uh, you also have these <coughs> private um, these investment houses that are trying to benchmark companies in a sector, so like KLD, the KLD metric, um, sorry, I can't remember the top of my head who the other um, folks are. There's folks like True Cost that developed the, the rankings from Newsweek. Um, but what's the best? I think there's just, it really maybe depends on the sector and what your goals are. Um, if you're trying to research and compare companies within a particular industry, for example. 
So I would recommend Socrates, which was KLD's product. I would recommend looking at the GRI reports of companies. Um, and there are a couple of others that are um, done by private companies who sell their research benchmarking sustainability performance. Great. Brian is asking uh, if you could give an example of how sustainability has been built into a brand strategy. That's a great question. Um, some I can't talk about because we're working with those customers. Um, I could talk a little bit about um, seventh generation, um, but it's probably not what Brian's looking for. He might be looking for more of a conventional brand. But um, if you look at the evolution of seventh generation brand, brand over the last 10 or 12 years, the brand used to be about the environment. And that what 7th Gen found by researching its, uh, the con consumer is they found out that actually what most people really care about is, um, is about them and their health and the health of their children and the local environments that fits their home. And that the big environmental issues they care less about. And uh, it's just the nature of, it's, it's kind of reality. It's, um, it's too bad, but that's what we really care about. So that's why you see much more emphasis on, um, on you know, the, the consumer in their home and their children and their health than you see often about the big, huge global issues like, for example, climate change or deforestation some other place in the world. This is a, you know, maybe one exception to this might be child labor because people can relate to child labor. But many other sustainability issues, they really start in the home and in the family. And so what you see is brands like 7 Gen move to messages around healthy for, you know, healthy for you, healthy for your children, healthy for your home, then healthy for the planet. And that's often a position. The other thing that we know is that, um, is that the, in, a, in the consumer product space, the time when um, people will change brands, and people just kind of, when you shop, it's kind of automatic. You just buy stuff. That's just the way most people shop. You don't have time to read a million labels. Most people don't. But the time when folks are open to making changes, if you've used a certain brand of toothpaste your whole life, the time when you might think about that differently is when you have kids. And so what you'll see is a lot of brands right around, for a sustainability strategy for a brand is, is right around that when a woman is pregnant or has a new kid, she's often doing most of the shopping for consumer, not for all consumer products, but in the grocery store. And so you'll see the positioning starting there. Having just had a baby 18 months ago, I would have to second that. <laughs> that was certainly when I started re revising my, my wish list on products. Um, we have two last questions. One from Jen. Uh, she starts by saying, I believe Walmart has a, a vendor sustainability scorecard. Do you see other corporate clients using a ranking system for their suppliers, um, partner vendors? And she says, it seems like this would be a good way to affect change, although most of us don't have the muscle that Walmart has to make suppliers make changes. Yes, I see it. So P&G now is a scorecard. Um, trying to, who else is, you know, IBM has a scorecard. Intel has a scorecard. Apple has a scorecard. It happens all the time. Uh, we see companies developing scorecards for Q1 suppliers. It's effective if the buyers use the scorecard results to determine who to buy from. If at the end of the day you get all the sustainability information and the buyer takes a look at it and they make the same purchasing decision that they would have made without that information, companies figure that out. They figure it out, we just have to get a pass. We can't fail at sustainability. We can't be an embarrassment or tarnish the brand. But the more that the buyer is incentivized or aligned with the whole, the whole sustainability um, platform of the company, the more those supplier scorecards have impact. Great, and this is our last question for the webinar. This is from Bronwyn. It's a longer question. It's got two parts, if I'm reading it correctly. But two questions regarding consumers. Uh, first, how does Stonyfield manage transparency? Some companies fear being too public about green actions and progress because consumers might criticize them for not doing more. On the other side of the coin, have you or Stonyfield had any interactions with this new cultural element of tea partiers trying to make sustainability a bad word? 
attempting to prevent countries from implementing sustainable development, for example. Right. So Stony Field is a, a bit of a, um, maybe they're a bit of an outlier here because sustainability is their competitive advantage. If, if Kraft can sell organic cheese singles, because right, they can do it, um, then what's Stonyfield's point of differentiation on the store shelf? And it's the brand. It's what the company stands for. It's what it communicates. And it's the stand that it takes. So they're, they're rather transparent about the work they're doing. Um, they know they're not perfect. And that's also part of transparency is talking about what you do well and what you don't do well. Um, but it's really important for them to be out in front and to be a leader. Um, I haven't seen the, the tea parties, and I've, I've read a little bit about this, like, you know, about, the, for example, seeing the UN announcements as, um, you, know, uh, you know, some draconian kind of world order effort to uh, control commerce or take away uh, rights here or free commerce in the U.S. Um, I've seen it on the, at that kind of metal level, but I, I haven't seen it at all, you know, at the at the level of an individual business entity or retailer, producer, brand. Great. Well, we have just another minute. And if you'd like to wrap up with any thoughts or, or sort of looking forward to what Pure Strategies will be working on in, uh, in the coming months or years? Well, um, you know, we, I think our strength is um, we understand um, the the brand side and the strategy side of sustainability, but today we haven't really a lot, talked a lot about the, the technical piece and getting the science right. And that's really important so that you, a lot of our work today is really focused on helping companies understand. We can't focus on everything. What are the hot spots for our product? What part of the life cycle phase for our yogurt, our cleaner, our wipe, our jacket, our shoe, where are the hot spots from a social and environmental standpoint? And then let's focus on those things and those opportunities. So getting the science right, understanding where the leverage points are, what the improvement opportunities are and the hot spots are, that's kind of where we see, um, that's where we're focusing right now with a number of our clients. And I think that's really, that's an important part of uh, the next step in sustainability. Probably the, the untouched third rail is consumerism itself, right? Um, we can all make the most efficient stuff on the world, but if everybody on the planet um, lives exactly like people in North America do, we're, we've, we've got a lot of trouble. Well, on that note, I would like to invite everyone. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, I think it's very true, and, and that will certainly be a topic for upcoming webinars that we hold as well. Um, I would like to invite everyone to visit the Patricia, uh, the Robert and Patricia Switzer Foundation website. We have additional webinars um, available for your viewing, previous webinars that we've held uh, on the blog site. We also have a lot of resources about our fellows, the kind of work that they're doing, and it, it's really just very inspirational to read their stories if you work in any field at all related to sustainability, which at this point I think it's safe to say we all do or should. Um, so thank you again so much, Tim, for joining us today and for this really fabulous webinar. We've had several people who, as they were signing off, said that it was a fabulous webinar, and, and thank you so much. I invite everyone to continue the conversation on our Facebook page, Twitter, or uh, at Pure Strategies website itself. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, everybody, for joining. So we'll go ahead and end the webinar now. Um, for those of you who are still on the call, please feel free to visit our website. You will be receiving an email in the next hour or so with a link to the blog and the webinar and Tim's slides will be posted there within about 24 hours, give or take a little bit. So thank you again for joining us.